Hi there, and uh, welcome to the CEO in Depth workshop. Um, my name is Michel. I'll be your host for this intro talk, and uh, hopefully, I will convince you that uh, CEO and Scala are good tools to enhance uh, your BIM experience. Uh, before starting, a bit of context. So Shio has been developed at uh, Spotify. Uh, if you've never heard about Spotify, it's an audio streaming platform. And behind the scene, uh, we collect 800 billion events a day. Uh, we have 18,000 data pipelines, uh, which of those 4K are running per day. And uh, there are like 2,000 plus engineers working at Spotify. So we do have data and we need good tools uh, to process it. About me, so I'm a band member since 2020. I've been developing in Scala for more than seven years now uh, in various OSS projects, so I contributed for into uh, Aka connectors, for instance. And I'm also a big mountain lover, so you can see that in the picture I put on the right. Now, uh, why Scala can, is, a, is a good tool uh, to process your data? Uh, let's have a step, make a step back and, and see uh, what is your experience with uh, the Java BIM SDK. I've pasted on the right an example of the word count that uh, is actually on the, the BIM uh, website. And uh, what we can tell about it, uh, first thing is that it's a, it's a bit verbose. So in this example that I pasted, uh, it's, it's not including the code of the, the functions. So the count words and the format as text are left out. And uh, there's a lot of text here already. Second thing is that uh, Beam has a really gigantic API reference. Uh, I've actually had fun uh, going into the Java doc and counting the number of classes. And you can find like 2,583 of those. So to really work with Beam, you need to have a, a big mental picture of what's happening there, what are the, the, the classes you need. And you may miss uh, things because it's, it's probably too big. And uh, last thing uh, about the style. So if you see this example, it's a bit like pre-Java 8 style. Uh, BIM suggests you can use Euphoria. I've never used it uh, to modernize a bit the style and be, and be a bit more up to date. So I think that's the three first comments that really shows uh, when, when you have your first experience with BIM. And I think we can do something better uh, with Scala. Also, uh, if we look at the, the JVM uh, LTS timeline, so what, uh, what happened there is like uh, 2014, uh, the Java 8 is released with a lot of improvement in stream, Lambda, optional, uh, interface default, uh, static method reference. In uh, 2018, uh, we have improved streams and collection API, local type inference, so the var, uh, the G1 garbage collector. Last year, uh, Java 17 was released with a text block, switch with return, records, sealed class, instance of pattern match, and uh, streaming to list. And uh, for 2023, uh, Java 21 is planned uh, with pattern matching of switch values and, and record, uh, virtual thread, AK, uh, the Loom project, and probably a bit more. So Beam already supports uh, Java 17. At Spotify, uh, our ecosystem for data is probably more here. So uh, still pipelines on Java 8, uh, a big chunk already migrated to, to Java 11, but uh, not yet finished. We will actually push to, to have everything on, on Java 11 uh, at end of the quarter. But the big problem with this is that uh, the ecosystem is here. So even if you use like Java 17 in Beam, uh, it's going to be only for your, the, your user code that you'll have all those new features. Probably all the libraries that you use are still uh, made for Java 8 to maximize compatibility. So you can leverage uh, those things, but uh, at some point you need al always to adapt uh, to what the libraries are providing you. 
also, when you look at data engineering, uh, it has more similarities with functional programming than uh, oriented, uh, object-oriented programming. So here are some, some points. Um, since we are like uh, executing the distributed mode, uh, you have immu immutability by default. So you can't share mutable state. Uh, that's good because in functional programming, uh, that's also the default. Uh, no order of execution, so everything is in is in parallel. Uh, functions uh, or can actually be run in parallel. There's no problem in, in, in this. Same code may be executed multiple multiple times. So we want to have idempotent uh, things, so stateless function basically. IOs are quite special uh, in the FP world also. Uh, all the side effects uh, are actually IOs and runtime interprets the program. So when you, you write uh, actually a, a BIM uh, pipeline, what you'll get is, is a program that you distribute and actually in FP, it's a bit the, the same. Uh, you, you write uh, your function and then you can execute it in the sync fashion, async, throwing error or so on. So it's really, really similar. And Scala, I think it's a, it's a good match. Uh, for, for, for both points that we, we've seen. Uh, first is like future is now. Uh, what I see is like a lot of um, backend or Java developers are super excited about uh, those features uh, in Java. And I would say, yeah, it's here for already ages uh, in Scala and it's actually very used in the ecosystem. Scala is also a JVM language. So it has easy interoperability with uh, the Java ecosystem and you can use uh, a lot of libraries which are widely adopted and, and supported, so it's pretty good. There's a mix of functional and uh, or object oriented uh, concepts, so it's not full functional. People may not be too lost uh, in Scala, and it's also not too exotic. Uh, Scala is already used by big data frameworks, so Spark and uh, Flink has a Scala wrapper too. Also, um, in my let's say uh, data engineer uh, career or let's say uh, education. Uh, there's something that really struck me um, said by Eric Mayer. So if you've never heard about him, he's quite famous to have worked on the reactive and, and functional programming. And uh, he's also known for his uh, very colorful uh, tie dye shirts. And he said, great programmers write uh, baby code. By this, he means that baby code is code that can be understood by anyone. And it's very uh, important in big teams for handover. And also we all had this experience going back into, into some code that we wrote some month before or years and we're like, what, what is this? Uh, you don't even understand your own code. So writing baby code is, is very important. The thing is like baby code with Scala, uh, it's probably not what is very, very obvious. Um, Scala has a reputation of being very complex. Um, I mean, it's out there, like uh, a lot of people complain that, that Scala is complex. So what can we do uh, to make Scala uh, easier and especially easier to read uh, for people? So that's why Shio comes in and uh, it's kind of an opinionated framework that really focuses on, on what matters. Okay, now let's dig a bit uh, into Shio. Uh, so here is a bit uh, the picture of what is uh, Shio in, in the BIM ecosystem. So Shio is the, the Scala API uh, that comes on top of the, the BIM Java SDK. But it also brings uh, some Scala libraries. Uh, we'll speak about them. For instance, there is Algebird or uh, some Scala test framework. On the execution, so Beam uh, can work in batch and streaming mode. And with Shio, we bring another uh, mode, which is the, the REPL. So you can play and, and test things uh, directly into, into a console. And Beam comes with a lot of uh, connectors, so cloud storage, pub sub, uh, and so on. And with Shio, we bring also uh, a bit of uh, extra feature the same way uh, Beam does. 
And let's focus first on the, the S collection, so the main part of, of uh, Shio. Uh, here I put the, the usual suspect of, uh, let's say, uh, Scala and, uh, and S collections. So on the left, you can see iterable of T, uh, the Scala collection. We have map, so with a function that transform a T uh, to U. Flat map uh, that transform the, the type T to an iterable of U, so collection of uh, U. And then filter with a predicate that just uh, filter the, the values. So very common, you have this also on the, the stream Java API. And uh, on the S collection, so on the right side, uh, we can see it's exactly uh, the same signature. So map uh, for the transformation, flat map uh, transform to a collection and uh, filter. The, the only difference is the decoder uh, will go, will come back uh, later into this. Uh, the cool thing is that uh, with S collection, you don't really need to, to learn new things because uh, if you know uh, Scala collections, basically you know how to work with um, S collection. And also there are some cool more uh, stuff. So on the bottom, I, I pasted like two more examples that exist on the, the Scala collection. You have collect uh, that takes a partial function. So from T to U. Partial function is basically uh, you transform where the function is defined. So it's a collection of a combination of map and filter basically with a nice syntax. And you can have uh, also group map reduce, for instance, uh, that takes uh, three function. So the key function that transform the, the your object to the key, the F that takes uh, your object and, and extracts the value and the reduce that will combine uh, values returning a map of key values. And in uh, the shear world, we'll have uh, S collection of uh, key value two. So here you see in functional programming, uh, functions of first class citizen uh, with higher order functions. So function that actually accept uh, function. And uh, yeah, as I said, uh, S collection are, are very similar to, to normal Scala collection. Also the difference between uh, beam uh, P collection uh, to be more idiomatic in, in this uh, Scala world. So you often work with P collection of this KV uh, type. Uh, in S collection, KV doesn't really exist. Uh, we fall back to this more idiomatic uh, tuple. So when you had previously a KV, uh, you'll use a, a tuple of uh, key to value. And also for the tests, uh, as an example, uh, we provide some, some test suites so you can write also idiomatic uh, Scala code. So let's consider the, the word count defined as uh, on the left. Uh, it accepts uh, lines of uh, uh, text and, and returns the, the word count. So if you have this input, uh, lorem ipsum, uh, you'll have the expected result here. Uh, what you can do in this collection, so you can uh, call run with context. It will provide you the, the context, which is really similar to the pipeline with some uh, nice additions to it. Uh, we transform our normal collection to a S collection with parallel eyes. We pass it to the work on uh, pipelines and we get the result. Then uh, you have this nice uh, syntax to, to assert that the result should contain in any order expected. So it's uh, containing or any order is matter uh, that works in S collection. And another possibility is actually to materialize your collection. So it returns a normal uh, Scala uh, sequence here. So you use run with data instead of the run with context. This one takes uh, first the um, a Scala collection uh, and then the, the function that transform this and returns an S collection and it materializes in the result. And then you can use um, the, the Scala test uh, matcher, which is the, uh, contains the same element as expected. So both tests are quite uh, quite equivalent. Uh, one asserts on the S collection directly and the second one uh, in the Scala collection. 
So now, uh, if we transform the road con example that we had uh, in the start uh, into into CEO, uh, we'll we'll have uh, this one. So the first line uh, is like we read the text file uh, with the input provided in the arguments. The flat map uh, we we split the lines uh, based on on these regex. So this uh, underscore is just a syntactic sugar uh, saying like um, you, you avoid uh, telling uh, parameter a row and then parameter, you just do underscore dot uh, to, to work on, on the lines. Same thing with filter, we remove the, the empty string. Uh, we have some goodies like uh, count by values, uh, a lot of uh, those very common examples um, that that have a dedicated function, and uh, and then we save the result as as text. So, as you see, it's it's very very short and and very clear. So, I would say one statement per line. Uh, this is clearly uh, baby code to me. Under the hood, uh, how does this work? Uh, as I said, it's, it's just uh, she was just. Uh, uh, Scala API on top of Beam, so it transforms actually uh, the flat map function uh, as such. Uh, it will call par do with the this do function uh, for every element. We apply the regex and uh, and then we we put them uh, into the the output. So sometimes uh, how we translate it's not exactly uh, what you expect. For instance, you may have expected flat map to transform to flat map elements. Um, this is due to some internal and sometimes code factorization. Uh, so you'll not have exactly one-to-one -one mapping, uh, but uh, behavior sh should work. So since it's a wrapper uh, on Beam, there's some implication. Uh, do functions needs to be serializable. Uh, so are as collections. And uh, the higher high order functions that they take only work if they are serializable. So in, in the previous case, we used a lot of lambdas. So lambdas may be, uh, must be Java serializable. In this example, uh, so object plus one must be serializable, no problem. If you use closures, so they must be serializable too. Uh, here in this example, we add uh, the the argument n, uh, which is contained in, in the args. So args uh, is the closure here, and it needs to be serializable. And if uh, this this arg is defined into into an object, or like the the owner also must be Java serializable. So if you defined uh, your pipelines or this arg into uh, an object, uh, my job, so my job needs to be serializable too. So we've seen so far how S collection improves over uh, P collection. We'll focus now on functional programming and uh, check how some concepts can be used to uh, ease development uh, in the data processing space. So we'll speak about algebra type classes and implicits. Don't be too afraid about uh, those. It's just some, some jargon that we will uh, explain. Uh, so let's start first with implicits. So in Scala, what you'll have to know is that uh, if a function has, has an implicit parameter, and when you call the function, you have in scope an implicit value that matches with a parameter type, this uh, value will be passed automatically by the compiler to the function. No need uh, to write it in your, in your code. Then type classes are something is something which is used to achieve what is called ad hoc polymorphism. So it's just that if you want to add a new function to a class, for instance, instead of extending the class, you can create a type class uh, that will do basically the, the same job. So you just don't have to to extend. And algebra is just like uh, math with uh, with symbols. So we'll use those three concepts to, to simplify our, our code. And uh, if you look back of, on our previous example, in word count, most of the logic uh, happen in the, the count by value. And uh, this only works with very uh, easy use case. When you have something more complex, uh, then you will probably have to build uh, the reduce uh, step yourself. So let's uh, consider the, the track popularity problem. 
if we have streams which are defined uh, li like this uh, with the, the track ID uh, of the, the track which has been uh, listened to, the user ID uh, of the user who listened the track, the timestamp uh, when the, the track has been, has been streamed, and the, the duration uh, of the, the stream. We would compute the track popularity like this uh, with three different uh, metrics. First is the, the number of plays, so simply how many times uh, this track has been listened to. The second one would be uh, the listening time, actually the play duration. Uh, if you think about uh, classical music, uh, the tracks are very long and it would be unfair to just like compute popularity by number of plays. Uh, if li user listen to it like for hours. And then we can consider popularity by penetration. So how many distinct user listen to this track? Uh, here we can define pop uh, penetration with a, a set of uh, user IDs. So if we write a pipeline to solve this problem, we'll have something like this in Shio. So we'll read uh, the stream from the, the Avro file we we'll then uh, key them by, uh, by track ID. Then we'll map the stream to uh, a popularity for the single element. Uh, it's quite easy. The stream will be considered one played. Uh, we have the play duration and the penetration will be the set of the user ID who uh, listened to the track. And the reduce step will be uh, as following. We'll sum the plays, uh, we'll sum the play duration, and then we'll create the, um, the union of the sets for the, the penetration. So it's fine, but uh, it's not very natural, I would say. Uh, what you would like to, to write is something more like this. You would simply say reduce by key and then you, you sum uh, the popularities or even better, you call sum by key and the framework will be able to, to make the, the, the summation uh, for you. And uh, guess what? Uh, S collection has a sum by key uh, function. Yeah, it's not really a surprise, right? And uh, here, let's look at the, um, the the signature of this function. So it takes an implicit parameter, which is a summary group of uh, V, so of the, the values. So summary group, what is this uh, this type? So semi group is uh, is is uh, something that tells if you have a semi group of T, uh, then the, there's an associative operation plus uh, for 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 this type. So if you have A plus B plus C, it's the same as uh, A plus B plus C. It must verify this uh, this rule. Uh, in our case of popularity, it's quite easy to define the semi group. Uh, we'll actually just move what we have in the in the radius step, and and put it in the in the plus operation. So here we created the semi group type class for popularity, and we'll have the plus operation on popularity directly. Here we'll say, yeah, great, uh, thanks, Michel. You just like move. Uh, the code from one place to another. Uh, there's not a lot of simplification. So, but what we change uh, basically is that we change the logic to the, the reasoning to the type. And uh, we can consider that if we have a semi group for long, for the final duration of our set, it will be very easy actually to, to derive automatically a semi group for popularity. Uh, so if you have some group on the type level, then uh, having grouping of those uh, would be very easy to, to derive and not write a lot of functions. Uh, here would be a, the, the example uh, if we have the assumption that we have the semi group for uh, long finite duration and, and sets, uh, we can just derive the semi group automatically uh, for a, a macro, for instance. And uh, the code will be like this, uh, just using some by, some by key uh, in the pipeline. So to me, it's like it's a pretty nice, uh, it's baby code, but uh, it's not a working code. Maybe some of you already uh, noticed. Uh, the problem comes with a popularity cardinality. So at Spotify, we have. Uh, 
422 million users on on the platform so of course you you can't have the set uh, of users to to compute the the popularity we have a space issue so how to we can solve this is using a probabilistic estimator like a hyperloglog log, uh, which requires a, a linear space to compute uh, cardinality so the good thing is that Shio Extra uh, package uh, comes with uh, the implementation of uh, hyperloglog, log, so the hyperloglog plus plus from uh, Zeta Sketch. So uh, in, in this package, you will actually have something like this. If you have an input of uh, S collection, uh, which is a KV, so key values, you can have this uh, as Zeta Sketch HLL by key that will return transform this S collection in a key to a Zeta sketch HLL of, uh, of V. And on, on this uh, S collection, you can call uh, some by uh, some HLL by key and then approx uh, discount by key uh, so that you'll have the, the S collection uh, with key and the cardinality uh, directly. So it, it's really nice. Uh, you have all the, the syntactic uh, sugars and the nice to have to, to play with uh, with uh, hyperloglog. Log. The problem in our case is that we also want to compute uh, plays and, and play duration uh, popularity. So this would have worked if for S collection, the KV in input would be just track ID to user ID. Uh, we could have used this, uh, this uh, methods. But what the doc uh, says uh, on um, Shio is that the, the Zeta Sketch HLL uh, has algebra, monoid, and aggregator implementation. So what are those? Monoid is actually a uh, um, specialization of a semi group. Uh, it's just a semi group what, which has uh, uh, an identity. We call it zero, and uh, we say. If we have a value plus zero, it's still the value. Zero plus the, the value, it's also the same uh, for every A. And uh, the aggregator is uh, the type class that models a map reduce and map operation. So first the item is mapped, then it's reduced uh, with the semi group, and then it's, present, uh, it's presented. So it just transformed to a nice syntax. Uh, here is the, the signature, the, the type A is the input, the B will be the intermediate step uh, type where we do the, the reduce, and the C uh, would be the, the result uh, of the aggregator. So basically, in our case, uh, if we define the input as this one, would be the, the stream uh, for the aggregator. The intermediate step will be uh, this popularity aggregator will aggregate on the plays uh, as before, the play duration, finite duration, and then we'll use the user uh, hyperlog log uh, with the, the Zeta sketch uh, implementation. And the result will be actually just the transformation where uh, we, we take the approximate approximate count from the hyperlog and we put it in the in the penetration as uh, a long value how would we define our aggregator for uh, for this uh, so as you see uh, on the three uh, types uh, the input is the stream popularity aggregator and popularity we need to override three methods so the first one is the prepare, as they said, the map operation that extracts from the input to the intermediate step. So it's quite easy uh, for the plays and the duration, it doesn't change. Uh, for the HLL, we just like create an HLL uh, with the, the single user ID that we have. The semi group uh, is uh, as following. We keep summing the plays and the duration and uh, as the documentation stated before, um, HLL uh, is a monoid. So if it's a monoid, it has a plus operation. So we can simply uh, sum hyperlog logs uh, together. And the present step uh, is just like we take this intermediate and we put it into the nice and, and clean popularity uh, class. And it's just uh, putting the plays, the play duration, and extracted the estimate size, as said before, from the, the HLL. 
So now, if uh, in our code we, we define the aggregator like this, uh, our pipeline just uh, looks like that. We read from a row, we key by track, we just say aggregate by key with this popularity aggregator and we save it as text file. So it's like super easy to read uh, and it's working code. So you've, we've hidden all the complexity into this uh, aggregator uh, type class. So we've seen some, some theory, uh, but I wanted to, to show you the, the real life example. Uh, I've actually implemented the, um, the track popularity problem with uh, real Spotify data. So let's just inspect uh, here the code. I'm reading also uh, the metadata and keying it by uh, track ID from an arrow file. Uh, reading the streams from uh, Parquet. Filtering just the, the skip track, uh, we just like will consider our streams which are like more than 30 seconds. Otherwise, uh, we, ca we can say it's just a skip. People didn't really listen to it. Uh, I'm keying this by track URI. Uh, here I'm just using collect because if the track URI is not defined properly on the, on the stream, we, we just drop it. So it's the nice uh, collect syntax. Uh, aggregating by popularity with the, the aggregator uh, as defined in the, in the slides before. Joining with the metadata, uh, taking the values. So we have the popularity and the metadata. I'm creating a, a track popularity that will take the track name, the main artist name, uh, the number of plays, the play duration, uh, two seconds, because after the aggregation, the milliseconds are not really important. Uh, and then the, the penetration and save it directly to, to, to BigQuery. Uh, so let's see, I've run actually the, the job uh, in, in Dataflow. You can see the, the graph here. Uh, so consuming like one terabyte of data uh, from, from the, the stream. I run it from the, the 4th of uh, July. Uh, then into BigQuery, let's uh, actually check uh, the data we have and, and see if we can find interesting things. So I've created a query to select the track and the artist and then ranking on the plays, the time and the penetration. So what we can see here is that on the, the top five, actually there's not a lot of difference. Uh, so things look a bit similar, whatever ranking you use. Uh, but here we can find some some big gap uh, actually. So 13 uh, in terms of ranking, 19th in terms of time, but like in the penetration, it would rank way, way lower. So if you look at this artist, J-Hope, uh, it's actually a, a, a K-pop uh, artist. So it really shows that uh, K-pop fans are hardcore fans and really listening a lot uh, to their um, to their favorite artists, but the penetration is, is not like widely listened to. And uh, if we scroll down a bit uh, further, we have also here an interesting uh, thing, is that we have uh, something that rank like 47th in terms of plays, but in terms of time would rank like 110. And uh, this is uh, kind of um, new uh, those uh, those days in, in Spotify. So uh, a lot of pop music uh, is actually uh, getting shorter and shorter. So if you have short tracks, uh, they, they tend to be played more. It feels like a bit gaming the, the system to get more, more streams. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's the, the way it is. So... That's the result for for the, the pipeline. So we've seen so far, we have a nice coding experience, but uh, operation uh, in Beam and, and Shio, uh, maybe things can be improved. So you all had this uh, this problem with our runtime errors in, in distributed world. Uh, it's very hard to debug and you end up with this uh, debugging session, everybody on, on the screen trying to find uh, what's happening. Uh, to avoid this, you all need extensive testing. So yeah, of course, testing will, will definitely help. But you can also have stricter code. So try to find the errors at compile time instead of uh, runtime and uh, having good logging and, and tracing. 
So we'll focus on, on the last two that can uh, be made in a framework. The testing is, is definitely on, on the user. So let's focus on the, the coder uh, problem. Uh, Beam states this, uh, when Beam runner executes your pipeline, they often need to materialize intermediate data in your P collection, which requires converting element uh, to uh, and from uh, byte strings. In most cases, uh, the Beam SDK is able to automatically infer a coder for a big collection. So what I hear there uh, is that in some cases, it may not work. So how to avoid that? Uh, here will actually require a coder at every step of your pipeline. And you say, when Beam says uh, it, it tries to infer the coder, it usually use uh, Cryo. Uh, Cryo is reflection based. Um, it, it tend to fail at, at runtime, depending on, on what's your, your data. And uh, if you don't have registered uh, cryo class, it, it may be inefficient. So we can use uh, implicit in type class again. Uh, if you define a coder, uh, they say from to byte, it can be this type class. So a coder of T, just an encode, a two byte string and decode from byte string. So it's really simplified. And here in S collection, uh, if you remember the, the prototype is like, uh, the type parameter is u, and it's also with uh, a coder. So it means it needs an implicit coder for the, the type u, and then it will be able to do the job. So basically, for every collection output type, uh, she will really require the coder uh, to be in scope. So you don't want to write coders for all of your model. That's why macro uh, come to the rescue. Uh, most likely in Scala, your data model will be case classes or tuples. So it's easy to infer the, the coders. Triggering the macro is made by, let's say, low priority implicit. Uh, this is the, the definition. Um, when it says low priority, it means that if you manually define an implicit for your type, uh, the macro will not trigger and the, the compiler will prefer yours instead. To, to derive the macro, uh, the, um, the coder, we use uh, a library called Magnolia uh, for different reasons. First, uh, it supports case classes, uh, sealed traits. So the sealed trait is this uh, private tra uh, interface hierarchy kind of. So if you have this tree, node, leaf, or option, some none, this is uh, defined in sealed trait in, in Scala. It works with recursive types and also if the compiler fails to derive uh, your your coder or your type class, it, it comes with an informative uh, message. On the performance, uh, if you check the, the serialization, uh, you see Java serialization, just don't use it. The numbers are very, very bad. Cryo, if you use register class, uh, it's kind of okay. Uh, can be better if you use a custom cryo coder. If you use Beam uh, custom coder, it's actually getting nice. And if we compare it to a Magnolia derived coder by the macro, uh, it's almost on par. It's a bit like uh, slower on the, the decoding part. And then uh, to facilitate uh, debugging, uh, you may still have coders that fail. Uh, what happened in your pipeline when coder fails since they are serialized and, and sent over the network, you have this kind of exception saying like, hey, you have a coder exception, uh, I can't encode this value. And then in the stack trace, you have just beam internal. So it doesn't really help you to, to find and locate where is the issue. Uh, what is the, the do function that actually failed? For the shield coder, uh, we actually made a, a trick to, to wrap it and uh, actually include the materialization stack. So each coder will remember from which place of the, the user code uh, it has been created. And in the exception, you'll have actually your user code saying, oh, it's my job that failed that line uh, 36. So it's also nice to have uh, for the operation. So that was just a, a focus on, on the things that can help uh, in this. Uh, on that, I think that was my last slide. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay. Um, yeah, I was wondering, so uh, I guess because of using the monoids and aggregators, you're uh, doing a combiner, like a pairwise combiner under the hood? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
is is there any case where you would want to do the sort of group by key into iterable style uh, combination instead of a combiner? Uh, so then it's um, on the, the implementation of the the aggregator for uh, Algebird. And sometimes it uses uh, optimization that, uh, that that takes uh, collections instead of, yeah, one by one. OK, so, so something will choose which one to use? Do you know that? Is there like a heuristic or? Uh, this, uh, I don't know really the internals, uh, to be honest, okay. of the, the algebra. OK, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, I was curious if you could uh, talk a little bit more about the internals of the uh, the Scala coder you had, like what kind of um, format it serialize it to, if it's like some custom format or something related to Avro or or something else reflection based. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Uh, it really depends on on the type uh, that you you will encode. Uh, basically, if you have Avro, it will use like the the serialization from Avro or Protobuf uh, from Protobuf, and then uh, the basic types are are using also the coder from from Beam. What we try to do is like uh, when we have this combination to find uh, the the best way to to do it. So, for instance, when you have like a type hierarchy, uh, like the, this macro will try to encode this uh, with a boolean if there's only two types or with an integer, and and then at decoding it says, okay, this is this class and uh, tries to find uh, the the underlying coder uh, for the the implementation. Okay, I see. So you're doing some kind of reflection based on the the types, I guess, to determine the best encoding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay, do we have other questions? Okay, so if we don't have any other questions, thanks again, Michel, for the session. And I think now we can start with the next session that is the hands on workshop. Okay, so let's start. So the first thing of all is that if you want to follow the workshop live in your laptop, and so please clone this repo. You will need the Scala um, development environment. For instance, personally, I'm going to be using IntelliJ, but uh, there are many other options. You will need to have the Scala build tool SVT installed. OK, so I have here the link. You can install it in, in Mac with the homebrew. It's probably part of your Linux distribution if you're using Linux. It's available to download for Windows. And then after doing that, I recommend you run running this command here, SVT compile in the directory where the code is, even if you don't have anything done yet, because it's gonna be like the, the empty code, but this will download all the dependencies that you need. And this is gonna be hundreds of megabytes probably. It's all Shio, all Bean, and all the dependencies, okay? So let's start. So what I have here is the repository already um, clone in and already loaded into my programming environment okay so this is a readme file so have a look at it to to run these commands like for instance what i recommend you if if you have already uh, everything uh, in your laptop and you have already installed svt just run svt okay and leave it running it will take a while it's not terribly fast okay and then here you type compile inside SVT. It, it will it will it will not do anything in my laptop because I have already downloaded all the dependencies. But in your laptop, it should start downloading a lot of stuff. Okay, just start downloading that and take it easy. Okay, and because it's gonna it's, well, it shouldn't take so much time because this Wi-Fi is supposed to be good. Okay, it will be maybe a couple of hundreds of megabytes, and then. In the repository, we have here the directory with data. Okay. Uh, that's actually here. This this should be called sample. It's in Spanish. Let, let me let me rename it. Uh, okay. So so basically, what we have here is the book El Quixote, Don Quixote. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's in the open uh, domain. It's uh, taken from Gutenberg books. And we are going to do a word count. 
like the typical example of a big data hello world uh, for any framework but we are not gonna do like the typical word count okay so we are gonna calculate the top words no we're gonna we're gonna calculate the word count and we're gonna do a top we're gonna sort by the number of occurrences of each one of the words and we're gonna find out which are the top words in the novel the really top words are gonna be useless it's gonna be like the most common words in the spanish language but we're gonna try to find out one interesting question about the book there are several characters in the book there is sancho the body of uh, don quixote there is dulcinea the crash of don quixote that is Rocinante, the, the, the horse, like a faithful uh, uh, horse. Who is mentioned more in the book? Sancho, Dulcinea, Rocinante. What do you think? Well, hold on, don't tell me what you think. Let's find out, okay? Let's, let's not guess, let's find out, okay? So this is what we are going to be doing here today. And for this, we are going to be using Shio, okay? Any questions so far? Gold clear, right? Okay, good. So you will see that there is already some code here so basically when you are doing a scala you have to create an object and you have to put the main method blah blah i have already done this for us okay and hopefully this will load if it's not okay by intellij just froze oh here it is okay so so it this is the the, the file that i'm opening okay uh, maybe it's because I opened the book, which is a little bit long uh, text file. Okay, so so here this is the the the, the file that I'm opening. Okay, and then I'm gonna just get a, a read of the of the file version. I'm gonna be programming in this full in this file all the time. Okay, so if I want to compile the code, I will go back to to my SBT terminal and then I will type compile everything I want to, to to compile okay and then we will see later how to run the code okay so let me let me just guide you through uh, the code that is already here and before we start writing some code okay so if you have already seen some Scala well so this part might be boring if you have never seen Scala before this can be maybe a little bit informative so the first thing that we have done, we have created an object, okay? So there are classes and there are objects in Scala, okay? We are not going to do any kind of object-oriented programming. We are gonna just put methods or functions, actually more than methods. So we're gonna, we gonna be using an object. And when you define a main method or in an object, so that's like the entry point of the object, like in Java or any other language, okay? Um, the main method accepts and command line options that we are going to be using for our pipeline. Where is the input data located? Where I want to uh, to write the, the the output? How many words do I want to like to 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 do to to have for the ranking? Okay, these are important parameters that we will see later. Okay, so how do I get that? Like this. Okay, very easy. Okay, so args is a map with a certain keys, or well, it's actually an array of strings, but uh, you can actually uh, uh no sorry no arcs is, is of type arcs and that's actually a map so you can take things from uh, as a um, with a key okay so this is the, na the name of the input option so this will be some location that i can read with the input data this is the number of words that i want and because this is normally well this is an string because th this is how options are read uh, at the beginning so i don't want to a number and same for the output file the output i will write it here okay then there are a couple of things here, like context and args. Where, where, where is this coming from? So this is coming from Shio, okay? So, so basically, Shio has a Shio context, okay? A Shio context, like if you have used a Spark before, it's like the Spark context. It's how you interact with the main pipeline, okay? And then uh, there is the, this helper function that if we pass an array of strings, that is normally how input command line arguments are passed to to uh, are passed to, to, to the code, it will parse that and it will create a map with a, uh, this option is equal to that. So it will it, it will do the parsing all, of all that for us, and then we will have that in this in this uh, in this object. And then this is a personal bias that I have. I always like my CO context or my Spark context to be implicit. Okay, so what is implicit? It was mentioned in the previous call. So basically, you don't have to pass it 
explicitly to other functions that need it. Which other functions need it? So we are going to do this RAM pipeline here. I always try to div divide my pipelines between the main and the RAM pi pipeline method. So the main, I do all the initialization. The RAM pipeline, I do actually the pipeline. RAM pipeline is going to need the CO context, but I'm not passing it explicitly. So that's why it's an implicit. However, it's here in this very long uh, line in the in the definition of the function is there. Okay, for sure, because well, so so it's, so you need, you need to do that. And and how does this work in Scala? So basically, when you have implicit input parameters in Scala, the compiler will try to find objects in the scope of the call to these functions that have the same type. And if it finds something with the same type, it will pass it. Okay. So the, the matching is done by type. Good. So far, so good. All these Scala things. Let's actually start talking about CO. So let's write our pipeline here in RAM pipeline with the input file, the number of words, and the output file, and the imp implicit parameters, OK? So here, for instance, we can use the, the CO context, OK? So perfectly, so that this is not a problem. And then this thing that it looks like I wrote something here. So this is actually also valid Scala code, OK? And this is really handy to make templates to be filled later on with exercises and these things. So this is something that it means, let's say, implement this okay and if for instance if i go here to intellij intellij will tell me okay implement this and if i click here it will put me even a box okay so so i don't forget where i have to implement the stuff okay but i will press escape and i will just uh, delete this okay so this is valid code so this is why our code compiles okay but if you try to run it it will not work because you have not implemented it okay questions let's read the input okay so to read the input when we are starting the pipeline in apache bin the first object that we put is the pipeline and then pipe or apply and the rest of the transformation so we do that here with the co context and i'm gonna be reading a text file okay. and then this is gonna be my input file so this here is gonna be an s collection of strings okay let me put this in a variable okay let me call it lines and if I put here this, okay, without the autocomplete of IntelliJ, I don't know how I would live. Huh? So it would tell me, tells me the type of this. It's an S collection of strings, okay? But these are not any strings, okay? So these are lines, full lines of the text file, okay? If we want to find out, we could do something like this, okay? So for instance, map. If you want to find out, you could do something like this and then run the pipeline. I'm not going to run it, okay, because uh, uh, I, I know I, let's say I have done this example a like hundred times already, like uh, over preparing for the workshop. And I, I know what is here, but let me put here a comment. So basically here, for instance, the first element will be something like this. And well, and the three dots is like it means that I write more stuff, okay, and then Whatever, like it, it, it's one of the sentences in the book. It will it will be like one element in this thing, okay? But we want to count words, so this is not what we need, okay? So this is well, we have already read the input. We have it in an S collection, so we can do stuff with it. But this is not the format that we want. So what do we have to do next, okay? And you will see that I'm a mostly Python programmer because I'm, so I'm putting like comments as in Python. So what do we have to do next? What's the next step? Help me here, please. Split words. Split words, yes. Let's do that. Thank you. Let's do that. Okay. So how I can split words? Okay. So I could do, for instance, a map. With a map, I take a function, and then I apply to each one of the elements, and then uh, the output of the function is the, the is the, what it will be in the is collection. Okay. And the input so. Um, in in a scala when when you have just one single argument you can just just put this underscore okay and and this input will be a string okay and i could do something like a split okay and then uh, a split by spaces okay and then each one of the input strings that will be this this means the, the same element i could put here like a lambda like this okay okay this is exactly the same as just putting this okay this is an a scala thing just for economy of writing Okay, now I'm gonna put this in a variable, and this will be the word. No, 
Let's have a look at the type. Is this what we need or not? Comments, suggestions. What do we have to do here? Ricard, don't say it. Uh, what, sorry? Flat map. OK, yes. OK, why, so why fl flat map? With flat map, I will unwrap this no so i will get rid of this okay so so basically it's one of the lines is mapped to several words okay so and the elements in a map one input element will be one output element that's a map okay so but then i, I need to unwrap this and i need to multiply the number of elements that i have i need to increase the cardinality of the collection so well so i'm gonna put here flat map it works in the same way except that here the type will be this now okay now and to make sure, so I could compile my call to make sure that I'm, I'm doing correct. Okay, so now it will take some more time because I'm compiling the code. Great, great, great. Okay, good. Now, so now what I will have then is this. Okay, this is this is gonna be my S yes collection. Okay, good. Okay, so far so good. Now. Do I have to do any other preparation for the works before I start counting? What do you think? Yes, what preparations? Sorry, say, say that louder. Okay. Uh, okay, the case, like uh, I have words in uppercase, in lowercase, different cases. And if I count them, different uh, uppercase and lowercase will be different words, and they are not different, right? Like for instance, N, if it appears in any other part of the book in lowercase, it should be counted with this okay what else should i do also okay for instance punctuation marks are gonna be also part of some words okay and i need to get rid of those let's do that okay for that i'm gonna create a new function and this is gonna be like a pure function in a scala this is not gonna be c or anything and this function is gonna get the word as input uh, it's gonna have it's gonna have um, uh, another string as output, okay? And here uh, I need to, for instance, I need to transform the um, the word to lowercase. Okay, good. And I need to get rid of punctuation marks. Okay, so how do I get rid of punctuation marks? Well. In reality, in a real case for natural language processing, we would have a nice library that would do all this preparation for us, but we don't have that. So let's let's create here a variable. Let's call it things to remove, okay? Like a static variable. This is gonna be a list of strings. No, a list of cars, I think. Yeah, let me. Okay, and then uh, here, Uh, uh, here I'm gonna do this, okay? So like, um, not like uh, this. I'm gonna use a um, single quote to to put charts, not to put strings, okay? So strings are collections of charts, okay? And I'm gonna, I don't know, like like a dot, okay? And a comma, okay? And what else? Um, exclamation marks. In Spanish, we have this weird exclamation. Well, weird for the rest of the world. If I know how to type it in my laptop, okay. Let me find international. Well, so so we have also like the other one, but I don't know even if my laptop is in English. The 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 the, word, the language of the empire, and um, I don't know how to type now Spanish even in my own laptop. Okay, so I apologize. Okay, so like exclamation. Eh? Uh, well, yes, I could do I could do that. Okay, so I could do like for instance. Um, Like this symbol here, for instance, I could copy and paste. So this is this is what I was meaning, okay? But, but it's really not. Let me put I don't know, like a colon. It's really not important. It's not, it's not gonna actually affect to like, like the validity of our question. But yes, yes, there will be lots of things that we need to remove, okay? Actually, there are more things that we want to do, maybe. Okay, so um depending on how the word is used the same physical word may have accents or not 
even if it's pronounced in the same way, okay? Like, like a Spanish 101. Uh, so, like, for instance, solo, if you are alone, or if you, it, if you, it, may, it may mean you are alone if it doesn't have an accent, uh, it means uh, only if it, if it does, but, uh, but it's the same physical word, okay? Um, maybe we want to count the same word always, even if, uh, regardless of uh, whether it's using uh, accents or not, okay? So, we can have also, like, um, a map here of a, a chart, sorry, and chart, and chart, okay, and then so basically every time we find a vocal with an accent, we remove the accent, okay. It's gonna be difficult to type this in in in. in if you don't have a, a the, the the, the Spanish keyword configure, okay? But don't worry, you can just put like a mapping from the vocal to the vocal, it will not do anything, but so, but just let's say to, for the typical transformations that we have to do with words, so for the sake of the example, it will be, let's say, it will work, okay? And then this another vocal. It may also happen, I don't think it will happen to Cervantes, okay, to be honest, okay, but, it may also happen that some people don't use the accents in Spanish uh, when they should, okay? Like looking at the teenagers, for instance, when they write, okay? So they 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 they, they, they relax the grammar, okay, of Spanish, okay? I don't think Cervantes will, will, will have done this, okay? But you never know, okay? So then, so it's it's better to normalize the words, uh, trying to into account, let's say, what's where the most typical usage of a, of a language. Good. So I think we have already everything that we need. So we have the map of accents and the things to remove. Let's go back to our method. So how do I remove things with a, in, in an S collection? In, 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 well, no, I was, I was going to say in an S collection. How do I th remove things in a string? A, a string is also a collection. Okay, so, so say you have a collection and you want to remove a stuff in functional programming. What do you do? Anyone? You filter. You can apply here map. See, you can apply filter. And 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 see at the type. See, see, have a look at the type. It says charge, charge. Okay, so charge. Um, because a uh, string is a collection of charge. Okay, so if I have here, um, a, a char. Okay, and then I have this this see here things to remove. Okay. I think because this is a list, I have this method here contains this char, okay? But I want to do like the opposite, okay? If my char is in this list, I don't want it. Like punctuation marks and all that. So let me put here not, okay? So basically, anything that is not in this list, I will keep it. Okay. Now, I have to do this here, like to apply this map. Well, this is self-explanatory. Let me put it here. So for a map, what do I have to do? A map, okay. And then for each one of the characters, I will take my accents map and I will take the equivalent here, okay? Any problem with this? Yes, indeed. What if? What would you have to do? Say that this is Java. What would you do? Uh, well, the, the map, it, it returns a list. The map returns as a character. You give a character and give you another character. What would you do? You would check. Sorry? Uh, yeah, please. Okay, I think you are going ahead, one step ahead. So in Java, you, you you would check if the map contains the key. If it doesn't contain the key, well, you put the character. If it contains the key, then you take the, the value from the map. And then this is much, much easier in, uh, in Scala and functional programming because you can get some kind of defaults, okay? So here for the map, you can do this get. <clears throat> With get, uh, you get the character if it's there 
or you can get a get get or else where you get the value of the map or a default value should that key not be in the map okay so what do we want we want this the, the this key if this key is in the map and if it's not what do we want same key the same the same word right is it, is it, is this clear this is the like the escalated way of doing things this is why i love scala and i cry every time i have to do java okay but but it pays okay so it pays my bills and remember i don't know if you have family i have a mouth to feed and and a son too okay so that's uh, so i i do java for a living okay so let's compile so far let's see so if we screw up no okay so far so good let's continue great now i have a, 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 a a function that given a, a string, it is gonna give me a clean string, good. You may have noticed that I didn't include any return here, okay? So Scala is all for the economy of language. The less words, the better. If anything that is in the last statement of a function is the return value of the function, okay? So this will return uh, one string, okay? So we, we can we can check it here. So we can do something like this, okay? And let me autocomplete the type. This is a string, okay? And, and see actually that uh, like uh, IntelliJ already put the X as, as the last step of the of the function because it, it, it detects that it returns a string and so on, okay? So this is a string. So whatever you put as the last statement in your function is the return element of your function, okay? And actually, another thing is that even if you have like a single line function, like here, like so, you can even get rid of the of the braces, okay? But I'm not gonna get rid of the braces because I uh, uh, so when when I get rid of the braces, I always uh, I always um, uh, forget about that, and then I make mistakes, okay? Good. So I have this uh, this um, function here now. And we can create another S collection of strings with the clean words. Okay, so what do I have to do? To the words S collection, and I'm gonna apply my function. Okay, like this. Okay, I, I could have put something like this. Okay, so, but in 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 a Scala, if you put, pass a reference to the function, so it's like a lambda uh, applying the function. Okay, so. So it's a, it's in the uh, to to the input element, okay. Okay. So now, what we will have here as output? So con we'll like continue with the same example. So it will be now this, okay. And I think we are now ready to count. So we, this is what we will get. So now, okay. So so now we can count, okay. Let, let's let's. How do we count? Uh, no i have no clue actually i have to confess something so no i have no clue how to count okay there is a method okay so this is what i like also of chio okay it's the functional way so instead of having a catalog of transforms that you you can let's say that you can go through and, and grab the transform that you need whenever you have a transform that you can apply to an this collection normally you will have already a method in that S collection telling you like like uh, we, we, you will have a method with all every transform that you can apply to this collection will have a method okay uh, depending even depending on the type of the of the of the function for instance if you want to write to be query because these are strings can do i have here oh see i don't have here write to be query okay but if i had the right type for write to be query here and at the right imports also uh, i could also have here a method write to be query for instance so but i have a count Oh, I have count. Oof. Really, I'm relief. Okay. So I have a count here. Good. Okay. What do I have to do? Well, so normally you will see in the Hello World's word count of big data, you create a tuple. You put you put the word as a key and then the value one. And then you reduce by the key of the tuples and then count, blah, blah. You don't have to do this with, with you or not with bin, actually. So you just count by value. Okay. But I wonder what will be the output type of all this. Hopefully, we have here um, we have here the 
um, the IDE helping with us with this. So we, we have tuples as output where the word is the key of the tuple and the number of occurrences of that word in the full S collection will be a number, a long in this case, because it, this can be really large, okay? So it's not an integer only, okay? It's a, it's a, a long. Great. So I have all my uh, words now counted. And now I want to calculate the top. I'm going to make a ranking. Let's do the same. Dot. Let me put here top. Look, look at this. So it's already done for us. Okay. This is so easy. Now top and the number of elements I want in, in the top. I have here the number of words. Okay. So let me put here a bar. Of words. And now here, let me put the type. Okay. So why do I have an iterable here? Okay. So what the does, imagine that you are putting this in a distributed runner. Okay. When you are running in local with only one single process, this is easier. But in a distributed system, how do you sort? To make it up, you have to sort, right? So how do you sort in a distributed way? You can make buckets and so on, like in different words, in different in different workers or windows, whatever we want to call them. But at some point, you have to put anything to put everything in one worker, right? Because otherwise, you will not be able to like if you are writing to some output in a distributed system, you cannot like put like a queue like you were at first, you were at second. So you need to bring everything to one uh, worker. Okay, so potentially two different elements of an S collection, potentially they can be in different workers. So if you want to write a sorted list, that sorted list has to be in the same worker. So that's why this single element to be written in the output is an iterable because it keeps that sorted list in one single element in one single worker to be written. And that this will be actually kind of a, like a silly S collection because it will be an S collection of a single element, okay? with that iterable. This is also why we have to take it easy with the number here, okay? So this number here, this is big data, but this number cannot be really that big, okay? Because that iterable has to fit in the memory of a single worker, okay? Great, work done, no? Well, I have to write the output. I will do it now in a bit. I'm gonna drink some water. Like, do you see, do you see anything wrong here or anything missing? Will it work? It's, uh, again, we do the platform. Yes. Uh, the fair enough, fair enough. So we have to we have to grab the output. Oh, fair enough. Okay, so I will write the output in a minute. Forget about that. Will it work? Will I get the top words uh, in the El Quixote? Will I be able to find out if El Quixote prefers his body to his crush? What do you think? Anyone? Let, let me make make you another question. So how I have actually no clue about this question. Eh? So full disclosure: How are tuples sorted in Scala? Because here, what I'm doing when I'm doing the count by value, okay, I'm getting here a tuple, okay, and here when I'm doing the top, I'm sorting tuples. Of the two values, maybe. Maybe. It's actually sorted by the key. Not the value at all. Okay. Well, well, we have some more work to do. If we look here at the top method, let me let me go inside this top method. Okay, this is gonna be scary. Uh, it has this input parameter number and then i have oh, and i started to sweat a little bit okay so implicit or ordering or collection iterable ordering what is an ordering this is one of the things i hate the most of scala so basically it's the way you tell scala on on how to sort of stuff what goes first what goes after okay like in numbers this is obvious because that's 
the type number for that in tuples well so probably with good criteria someone decided that well if you are sorting tuples you're sorting by key okay and that's it but here we are sorting by uh, by by not by the value okay so we have to create an ordering so if you have like 45 more minutes so it will take me only that so like to write an ordering correctly in in several attempts okay so whenever you are in this situation so whenever i'm in this situation so it's like i'm just want to throw the laptop through the window because I, I had all these things so these are the complex stuff okay but hopefully we don't need that okay so we don't need we don't need the ordering Scala wants to to sort my tuples by key. Fine, so be it. Okay, let's give it the keys, the keys that 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 that, that, that it wants. Okay, so here the counted we can have. So the counted is is a nice collection of tuples, right? So it, it will have methods, new methods, magically uh, that can be applied to tuples. And there's one here. It says swap. What does the swap make? Look, look at the output type collection of long and a string it swaps the tuple okay poof so here i have the swap s collection and this will be this okay like and now when i do this instead of this s collection i use the swap and then the type here will be this because And because the, the first the key is a long, so this will be sorted by long, and it's a top, it will be sorted from the highest to the lowest, which is what we want. So, well, good. Okay. This is safe. Okay. Now we have to write the output. Great. Do ha we have to do this unwrapping. I'm gonna write a CSV, okay? So because this is typical in data. And then I have here tuples, and I cannot write a CSV. Okay, so I could do this in many, in many ways. I could not do a flat map, okay? So you could be tempted to do a flat map here, something like this, okay? What would be the, what would be the problem of doing a flat map here? What, what do you think? If I do a flat map here, what's, what's the issue? So we have much the same keys because we have numbers. So for example... No, that's not the issue. What's the issue? What do you think? Ah, it's an iterable. It's an iterable. I, I will get rid of the iterable. And then if I do this, I will have here, an s collection or s collection of this it's the same type as before so i will have that okay only with the elements of the top for sure what's the problem if i do that yes 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 um top by key makes that but um, uh, when you have several elements with the same key, it will do the sorting per key. Here, I want to sort the full S collection. And the top uh, by key, it will apply the sorting to, to all the elements that have the same key. And you will have a tuple of the key oh. and an iterable of the values. So it's still making, it's like, it does the group binding. Yes. Okay. Yes. Question. Maybe this is related to flat map, but uh, are we sure that it's sorting our logs Order. Exactly. Well, no, I, well, no, no, no. Yes, yes. We are sure because the top will start in descending order. But the flat map has a problem with ordering, actually. Not, not exactly that. So, what's the issue if I do a flat map? Yes. I think it remains the, we need to pass the portion in the flat map. Well, yes, yes, yes. So, so I wrote here like code. Yes, I have. Yeah, so it's, it's incorrect, the syntax. Yes. But um, imagine that I apply it correctly and I get that output. Yes. exactly so if i do a flat map i'm passing from one element to n elements of the s collection and this is going to be a small s collection most likely in no runner will distribute this because it's a handful of numbers but we don't have guarantees for that okay and when we are going to write it so this will be potential in different workers and the order in which the data will be written to the output is not guaranteed okay and then we will lose the order okay so we have to live with this pesky iterable like uh, until the end of the pipeline okay because the moment we unwrap this and we transform this single element of an s collection into several elements of the s collection it will be distributed again and then we have lost the order okay order in a distributed system 
it's hard, impossible, okay? When you're writing the output. So there's no there's no order in the, the writing. It's like a, like a, the first come, first write, okay? And it's like and different workers will be pushing with each other. It's like, oh, I'm gonna write, no, I'm gonna write, okay? So there's no coordination between the workers. Okay, so let's write then. So let's transform to CSV, CSV lines, okay? So this will be a variable. And what I want to achieve is an S collection of one single string, actually. Okay. <clears throat> so I have to do this map. Uh, so basically, here um, I will get um, each one of the tuples. Okay. Well, let me actually let me put it here. Each one of the tuples. Okay? So this will be a tuple. See? Or like any table of, no, this is wrong actually, no? No, this is correct actually, no, this is correct, okay? The map will apply to each one of the elements of of the of the um, S collection and this is an iterable. So what do I have to do? Oof, get another map, okay? Okay, and if I do that, um, here, uh, the element, let's call it like this, I will do something with this. Okay, I will do something with this later on. Okay, and now I have the tuple. Good. Okay, so I have the tuple. And actually, I could do something like this in, in Scala. I can unwrap the tuple. I can do a matching to each, each one of the elements of the tuple. Okay, what I have here, like the number, which is a long, and the word, which is a string. Okay. Okay, and now here, for instance, I can create a CSV line. Okay, I can make a list of the of the word as a string, uh, sorry, the, the number as a string, and then something like this, mm. separated by commas, okay? This will create, a, uh, so, so this will create something like this. Okay. Um, okay. And I'm gonna write it with, with this, I could swap the order if I want, but I want to have the, the number first because that's gonna be, easier later for like, having a look at the output. Now I have this, this will be an iterable of strings, okay? So if I return only this, okay, see, that's an iterable of strings. It, it, so intelligence is telling me like, no, this is not a, a string, okay? So, well, good. So I have to take this iterable, let me put it in a bar, okay? Yes, this, okay. Um, these are CSV lines, okay? Let me add the type, okay? It's an iterable of strings. Now I could do something here like this. Make a string and put like line jump, okay? So this is why the iterable was pesky, okay? Because it allows, it, it forces me to do a lot of stuff that I want to do. I don't want to do, but well, so I have to do it, okay? So this is life. No, we cannot always do what, what we want. So we, sometimes we have to do what we have to do. So, so this is the same here, okay? So I have to deal with this uh, one. But the good news is that I have now one collection, S collection of one string. And this is actually one single string, one single element in the S collection with several lines, okay? And the lines will keep the order, okay? So because it's one single element, okay? And now I can actually just write I think uh, I think I don't remember how to write to text to file. Save as text file. Here it is. Okay, I did, I wasn't remember. So I can now save as text file, and then I can use this output file here. Okay, and and this is not returning anything. Okay, so so I just let, I think so. Let me see. Oh, well, it's actually written a closed type of a string. So it returns some metadata of, uh, about um, what this did, okay? Which might be useful for, for some situations, but I'm not gonna use here, okay? Okay, so this is our pipeline. Let me just, I included here the CO context run because I forget all the time about doing this. And then I run the pipeline, I submit it to Dataflow. It takes like one minute and then it's like, you already finished, okay? So because I forgot this, okay. So so you have to do, you have to call this explicitly. Okay. Questions. L let's run this. 
let, let's, let's compile it and let's try to run it, okay? Let's compile it. Let's see if it compiles. So how do I run this? If I want to run quickly, for instance, with my sample data, I can run here straight from SBT, okay? But if I want to deploy this later in Spark, in Flink, in Dataflow, I will have to do something differently. Let me first like show you how to run the main function here locally, and then, then how to create a package so, so you can actually use it, use it in the cloud or whatever. So here you have a run main, and you can, you can uh, pass a package name, and it will run the main function in that, in that, in that package. And then here, so you can use, all the options as in the command line, okay? Like this will be known words, let me put 10, an output file, I'm gonna put it, what day is today? It's uh, 20 of July, something like this, okay? And then if I run this, So let, let me just remind, this is how you run the main function, okay? If I run that, if I run this, and this is correct, it's taking a while. This, you mean? No, the, the <laughs> I will make a commit in a minute, so you will have this code also in the repo. But if you are if you are stuck, you, you, now it is the time to look at the solution. Now it's fine, okay? You will not be tainted, okay? Let me have a look at the output here. So here I should have now a directory that it says TMP, uh, here it is, okay? TMP live, blah, blah. Here I have this part 00000 file, and then I have here the top 10 words in the novel, okay? Good. As a, as a, as a like a, a test of a, if things are working, this is good. Let's actually run with the full novel, okay? And with the full data. Okay, so here, um, so how do I create a package? I can use the stage command, okay? And this will create a package that you can use in Linux, in Windows, in many other places, and that you can submit to a runner, okay? So just before I do this, I included here only dependencies for the Google Cloud runners, okay? Uh, let me just see, these are the dependencies, for instance, for Dataflow. Uh, so if you want to, if you want to uh, to use any other runner, well, so you will have to add the dependency for this, okay? So uh, like for Spark or for Flink or, okay? So, um, but it's, it's easy, basically. So you find the package and then you, you have already here the Beam version already already uh, selected. So you can add any other uh, runner here, okay? So when you, when you run this stage command, okay? It will basically create some packages. Let me go, let me exit this, okay? So here now in the target directory, I have this target universal directory, and then this stage, okay? And in this stage, I have this bin scripts, and the lib, the lib directory is also necessary, okay? Which is basically with two scripts, okay? That I can use to run my pipeline either in Windows or in a Unix system, okay? And now with this, I can run me, my pipeline with the full data, okay? I can do this target, universal, stage, bin, show quick start, and the input file will be, uh, well, let's use the full, the full, full book now. The number of words. Let's put 250 because, spoiler alert, some of these characters are not in the top 100 words, okay? And the output file, let me put the TMP full book so we don't, we don't, uh, we don't override the, the previous output, okay? 
And with this, this will take some minutes, I think. Well, not minutes, but seconds at least. So I think now it's the moment for questions if this doesn't fail, OK? OK, it, it didn't fail. So here is the command that you have to run. First, SBT stage is included in the readme, and then this, this command in the in the um, in the command line. So while this runs, questions, comments. Yeah. Oh, well, here, here. Yes. This is a good question. So I didn't indicate any runner, right? Then it's using the direct runner. That's the default one, same as in bin. Okay. If I wanted to use any other runner. Uh, I would have to put like minus minus runner and then another runner and then other options that are runner specific. Like if it is uh, for instance for data flow, the project of the Google Cloud project, but those will be additional input line uh, parameters to these scripts that are created by the stage uh, common. More questions? Yes. Um, this is a good question. Ah, yes. Uh, well, so so can we have multiple geo contexts? Well, you could you could have that in the in your in one package if you want. Okay. Um, and I have seen customers doing that with Bean, not with Geo. Uh, like having several pipelines, pipeline objects in the same job. So initially you could do that. Yes, there is no, nothing preventing you of, uh, like nothing preventing you uh, for doing that, but I, I wouldn't do it. So I, I cannot find a case where you would need different jobs in, like different pipelines in the same job. Okay, so if it's different pipelines, it should be different jobs and different CEO context then. So like different triggers uh, or like different instances of the pipeline. Or like different pipelines with different instances, but sometimes so sometimes I have seen customers doing that and it works. I guess like in terms of, for instance, in data flow for auto scaling and all that. So in terms of estimating what's the amount of work that is done, what's the amount, what's the amount of work that is remaining, where are the resources that I use, and so on, it will mess up. Okay, in in a way, okay, because say that like if you have a big asymmetry between one pipeline and the other. One needs a lot of resources, the other, I don't know. So it, it will not be ideal. So I would tell, I would say, let's say, re resist the temptation of using more than one CEO context, but I, in, initially it wouldn't fail, I think. Yeah. Or, or two branches in the same pipeline object. Okay, so. Yeah, if it's possible, which is, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I would say like when you have graphs that are not connected in a job, that's a strong indication that those should be different jobs. Question here, yes. This is a really good question that I have no clue. Ah, yes, repeat the question. I forget always. Is there any intention to make Shio part of the broad Apache Beam project? I have no clue. I don't know. And I'm speaking only of myself here, but I wish that would happen. Yes, that would be great. But I'm not sure. I don't know. So this is, well, so this is the Spotify folks, the ones I have done Shio, and I love it. It's really so, it allows me to use Scala with data flow. So, which is really great but um but it's a spotify project it's not it's not a, uh it's not an apache project okay so yeah yes 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 so there are mentions like if, yeah but 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 there are, there are no other relationships that well like the like, like the ones we have here so far i don't know so but i think that's a yeah that's a good idea a good suggestion and yeah, maybe in the future but i don't know so i wish like personally i wish that it would be under the Apache umbrella also, because that would be probably good for 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 C as a, an open source project. Um, but I don't know. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. So so like. Yeah. 
it, it would take a lot of work from people in you know, or Spotify to pass that sort of control information. No, no, I don't think so. It's open source, so it's uh, it's already. What what's the license of C already? It's Apache, no? Probably. Yeah, it's yeah, Apache I license. Think, I mean, not not from the, that's inherently a problem, but I think yeah. I think even if it's just if you just transfer the ownership, um, not much is changing really. Uh, it's more about you know who's contributing and taking it. Yeah, and that's the bigger question: who was spent time working on it? Uh, to me, at least, more relevant than than just the formal owner. That's my personal take. Uh. Yeah. Okay. So this was a serious matter. More serious matters. Let's find out. Okay. Body, crash, horse. Let's see. What's the order? Horse. Okay. So, que conjunction in Spanish very common. Is the first, the most common word in uh, in 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 the novel. Let's search for Sancho. Sancho, Sancho, 1,567 times mentioned in the book. Rocinante, 201 times. Okay, so, well, Don Quixote prefers his body to his horse. Okay. Dulcinea, oh, this is mentioned more times than the horse, okay, but 276 times, okay, so, well, Don Quixote, for whatever reason, so we don't know why, but mentions like around like a five times, six times, seven times more his body than his crash. Okay. Well, so this was the workshop. Let me put the, 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 the code again. Okay. So I hope that you learn a little bit about how to use CO with, uh, with, uh, um, uh, uh, for, for doing Apache Bean pipelines in Scala. Okay. I strongly recommend it. So I, deeply convinced that functional programming is the mindset that you have to have in order to write successfully pipelines of data. Personally, I help customers uh, fixing issues with uh, pipelines uh, in Apache Bean. And a lot of the times it's, it's about, let's say, applying different mindsets uh, of how things are done in generally in software development compared to how data pipelines are. So if you look at all the primitives of a data pipeline, it's like it's, it's that's functional programming okay so i strongly recommend you having a look at seo so i love it and it's used by spotify and other big customers too like uh, twitter and others and and yeah so i strongly recommend you like having a look i will upload the code that we have written to the same repository where that we have used today but you have the full solution also in the solution in the solution branch but and one more question yes this is really a very good question yes can you use your p collections your p transform your p things from being in seo yes you can yes you can so you can always um like for instance let me use this uh, apply uh, 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 see like this here apply transform see that that's uh, the input is a p transform okay so you can go from the seo wall to the bing wall and then get back to the show world if you want. So if you need so, okay. Say that you want to use one nice P transform that is available in in Java that is not available in Shio for whatever reason. Uh, yes, you can use that, okay. And then Shio will take care of transcoding all the data and all that. So more questions? Yes. I'm wondering what, like, why, why that are you implying with that question? <laughs> Sancho was really preferred to Dulcinea. Uh, this was data driven. I don't know the counts. Maybe make sure that you're in the book, and not the sample. Yeah, I think it was on the Yeah. So, or maybe well, yes, for sure. Like also, these two things, like. What the um, what the things you are removing or how you are mapping this may have some influence too. So I hope that Sanchez is still mentioned more times in your case too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then okay. There is no then there is no no fraud here in what I showed. Okay. So. Oh, that's strange. <laughs> okay. Okay. Question here. Can we pass in the escalation? 
Uh, the beam heat transport. Yes. Uh, only a heat transport directly from the, uh, the X collection flow. Then we pass a P transform. Uh, apply a P transform, you mean? Yes, uh, beam heat transform in the. Or maybe we, we have to switch to P collection. No, 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 you don't have to. So, so here, so it's applied to this, this function here, apply transform. Okay. okay. So apply transform. Let, let, let's let's do this, okay? So let me, so for instance, okay? Yeah. So if you look here, so I can I can pass any transform. I don't know. Like, let me see if I can do this. Like this, well, I, don't, I, have, I will have to instantiate this. Well, it's going to be more difficult, but yes. So basically, with let me let me put it like you can always pass a P transform, and then what you will get, and and you can also let's say get a P collection. I think and how I don't remember right now, but you can also get the P collections. But you can always go from the bin to the shear world all the time if it's required, and sometimes it's required. Yes. Is there a method to convert a P collection to a S collection and vice versa? Yes, and I don't remember which one it is, but yes. Okay. Yes. Question here? That was the same question. Okay. Yeah. So there is a way to transform S collections into P collections. And like, for instance, when you are applying a 3P transform, so your S collection will be a P collection. Okay. And when you are returning a P collection from the transform, it will be transformed back to a S collection. Okay. That's questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the thing is that if, it, if it's a wrapper, I don't think it's like a, a subclass or like. No, no, it's 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 not it's not only it's not only like like a light wrapper. It has a lot of more magic in. So like let's have a, so see it's a P collection wrapper and this is another class of a C. I think see so it's 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 more complex. Okay, but but yes, but basically you can you can you can recover a P collection um, and apply basically bin code. Uh, if you are missing something in the Scala in the Scala uh, API, yeah. Uh, Question. Uh, level uh, level like another another very good question. So, what happens with the state and timers or other deeper level uh, features of Bean? For state and timers, I think there is a map with the state here. Let me see. Uh, maybe I have to import something. So basically, there are, there are maps, additional maps that they, with a state and timers, also for for CEO. Okay, but I don't remember right now the name. And and in any case, like if say like tomorrow there is a new type of UFN that is the like a splitable UFN or whatever that is not supported by CEO, but they are supported. But imagine that something that is not supported. So you could just let's say do a pardu and a UFN and all that. So yeah. So, so it's a, it's the same, so, and you could do, do you could do that. But for state and timers, they are supported in CO2, okay, but in a different way. So you have a map with the state and timers, same with side inputs. So because you, in a map you have to pass like a pure function. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but in the examples, uh, um, there is an examples library of CO. So there is examples of how to use state and timers with with uh, S collections. Yes. Yeah, yes. You can also. Uh do some extension and class implicit maybe and as collection in scala to add uh, some behavior yeah, this is how co works actually so so be via implicit depending on what you are doing the type that you're using or what you're importing so you can you can write to a text file like for instance here i can write to a text file because this is a string okay like if i try this with top words let will this work maybe maybe it will work yeah it will work also okay but depending on the type that you have and what you're importing, so the methods that you have in your S collection are ones or others. Yes. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So if we don't have any additional question, we are just right on time for the next session. Hi.
Welcome to our presentation on join optimizations at Spotify. Um, I'm Claire. And I'm Kellen. Um, we're two data engineers at Spotify. We both work on the Shio project. Um, and this presentation is going to be about various join strategies we use to handle Spotify scale data and how you can use them in your pipelines. OK, so first I'm going to talk about the vanilla join operation. Um, and so when I say vanilla join, I mean something like an inner join in SQL, where you take a left and a right hand side and you end up with these one to one flattened tuple pairs of corresponding left and right hand values. Um, join is actually not offered natively in Beam. Beam natively has the co group and group by key transforms. But in Shio, uh, we can leverage those beam primitives to implement the inner join. Um, so to get started, you can see we have our left and right hand side S collections. S collection is the Shio wrapper over a P collection. Um, and you can see they're both keyed by the same key type K. Um, if you're not familiar with Scala, this is kind of a tuple notation that we use to denote a keyed S collection. Um, so we take those two S collections and we apply the beam primitive of co-group. Um, and what that gives us is this single P collection of a key and these co iterables of co-group results. Um, and the co-group basically works by taking the union of the two collections and then grouping by key. And you can see that the co-group result contains iterables um, of all of the elements corresponding to that key um, tagged by their source, either left or right hand side. So this is the beam kind of built in co-group transform. Um, and then back on the Shio side, we apply a flattening step. Um, and so that flattening step takes us from this kind of nested iterable structure to the tuple form. Um, so this tends to be an expensive operation, um, usually the most expensive part of the pipeline. Um, and we find that it's usually because of the shuffle aspect. Um, so a co-group, the beam transform, um, involves a shuffle operation. And if you're not familiar with MapReduce terminology, the shuffle is the part of a um, MapReduce operation in which all elements corresponding to the same key it's shuffled to be on the same worker. So you have some network overhead of sending the elements from worker to worker. You have some overhead of doing the shuffle computation itself. And you have to serialize and deserialize the elements to send them over the wire. Um, so all that adds up to be pretty time consuming operation. Um, and that's what this talk is about, is alternatives to this vanilla join operation that we use at Spotify. Um, and most of these join operations work by reducing the amount of shuffle. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Kellen to get started. So one operation that we can do, or one optimization we can do, is when the right-hand side of a join is relatively small on the order of a gigabyte or so, um, it can fit into memory of all the workers. And if we can do uh, a broadcast of that to all workers, we can reduce the amount of shuffle required. So in Beam, we do this with something called a side input. And this is uh, equivalent to like a Spark broadcast. Um, so here we're looking at effectively the same inputs as before. We transform the right-hand side into a map. And we turn it into a side input, which gets moved to all of the workers. So when the workers finally see the left-hand side of the collection, there's no longer any shuffle for the right-hand side. And instead, you just do a static lookup into the side input. Finally, we have the same flattened step as before, uh, which gives us the same result. So this can be substantially more efficient than shuffling all this data. So as an example, uh, you might you can imagine a case where we want to take uh, streams of Spotify users and uh, indicate that the tracks that they've listened to were featured on some playlist. 
And using the hash join syntax, all you have to do is key each of the collections by track ID, and your the next step in your pipeline automatically has the pairs of stream and this uh, featured case class, uh, which have, in, includes the playlist ID, uh, instead of needing to do any sort of manual work with site inputs. Uh, next up, we have something that we call a large hash join. And this is for a similar case as the hash join, where you want to uh, avoid shuffle. And the amount of data you have is uh, larger than the roughly one gigabyte limit we suggest for a hash join, but where it can still fit easily on the disk of a particular worker. So, you know, roughly 100 gigabytes, you can scale your disk differently in data flow, but uh, that's a good rule of thumb. And what we do under the hood is we use uh, a Sparky, and a Sparky is a Spotify project that's effectively a um, read only hash table on disk. And it provides these features where the, the point of all these is that you uh, on some sort of regular cadence output uh, an entire new uh, Sparky for some input data. So in our case, that would be the, um, the featured uh, tracks uh, from the last example. And then you can shuffle those, or sorry, you can send those to each of the workers uh, without needing to shuffle them. So similar to in the standard hash join case, we start with the same collections. We produce a Sparky of the right-hand side of the collection. It gets moved over to all of the workers. And when we finally uh, are looking at the left-hand side of the collection, each of those workers, instead of needing to shuffle the right-hand side, we just do a lookup into the Sparky. The Sparky is uh, on disk, so there's uh, additional overhead from a side input, but it's still relatively fast. And it's definitely faster than uh, shuffling in a lot of cases. Finally, we do the flatten step, and we end up with the same result. So to expound a little bit on this, the syntax for your usage would be something like left-hand side dot large hash join right-hand side. This is roughly equivalent to uh, producing a large multi-map side input on your own, uh, adding that to your left-hand side, and then mapping and doing a lookup manually. So the actual get here, which is um, included in the convenience function, uh, lazily reads the Sparky from storage, which is usually on, on the network, on GCS. And the actual production of the Sparky, this right-hand side as large multi-map side input, uh, is roughly equivalent to grouping by the key of the Sparky and uh, translating the key and the value side to bytes, and then saving as a Sparky file to GCS. So here's the right would actually happen here. Uh, another join optimization we have is called a sparse join. And this is when the left-hand side is very large, like in our streams example. And uh, the right-hand side is also large, but um, is still smaller, substantially smaller than the left-hand side. And in this case, what we do is we use a bloom filter to avoid doing a full join. The, um, we split the, uh, the left-hand side into uh, different partitions, uh, one of which has all the keys which don't exist in the right-hand side, and the other which does. And the expectation is that most of the keys in the right-hand side are also in the left-hand side. So a Bloom filter answers a, a, a question of set membership, like, have I seen this value before? And in a normal set, you will do this uh, myset.contains, and it will tell you for sure that it's seen a value or not. But a Bloom filter is probabilistic. So its answer is, uh, the question you ask it is actually, uh, may, do, might we contain this value? Or does this set probably contain this value? And uh, the answer is probably yes, or, or no, for sure. Um, so there's a lot of use cases for Bloom filters uh, in other places in Spotify, we use it for, uh, for example, this use case, which is to look up uh, if a if user listens to a particular artist or not. And if you need to know for sure if user X listens to Beyonce, that can be an expensive lookup. But if you are able to accept some, some false positives, then you can do this lookup substantially more cheaply with a Bloom filter. 
So a little bit of background on how a Bloom filter works. It's a, uh, a bit array and a series of hash functions. And for each element that you want to insert into the Bloom filter, you pass it through each of these hash, hash functions, and they will set some subset of bits in the bit array. So in this case, uh, when we hash x, we get these three bits that we're, we set to 1. And when we see our next value, y, we hash some different set of bits. And when we hash z, uh, we see that z uh, hashes to two positions that we've already set to 1. And that's part of the, the standard functioning of a Bloom filter and where the false positives can come from. So when we want to check if something is in the Bloom filter, we take a value x and we rehash it and we look at those positions. And if all of them are set to 1, then we say that the filter uh, might contain x. So here we say yes. But in the case of A, it hashes to some other subset of bits. And despite the fact that we haven't seen A at all, uh, we can still get a positive result. So as before, we have the same left-hand side and right-hand side. We construct a Bloom filter from the right-hand side. We propagate it to all the workers. And when we do the lookups uh, with the left-hand side, we then partition the left-hand side into these two separate uh, two separate P collections. And we then take the, right, the original right-hand side, and we actually do a join on, like a standard join on the overlap. The, the, the overlap is the set of keys in the left-hand side that also exist in the right-hand side. And in the case of our inner join, the part of the left-hand side that doesn't have a key in the right-hand side is just discarded. Um, in other cases, we actually you know, do something with that, but here we don't. And finally, our output is the same as before. OK, so next I'm going to talk about skewed joins. Um, so this is also designed for a use case when the left-hand side is large. Um, but in a skewed join, it's designed for when the left-hand side also has many hot keys. So if you don't know what a hot key is, it's a key in one of your data sets that occurs with disproportionate frequency to other keys, disproportionately larger, that is. Um, so for example, at Spotify, you know, if we have a song that goes viral or something like that, um, the number of listens for that song might constitute a hotkey if we were to be grouping on song ID, right? Um, and so what might happen if you try to use a like a vanilla join operation on a skewed data set like this is, during the shuffle phase, um, when all elements with the same key are trying to be sent to the same worker uh, and they get materialized in memory on that worker, you're going to run out of memory because the hotkey is so frequent. Um, and that can be a real problem depending on the level of aggregation that you're trying to do. Um, so that's where the skewed join comes in. It uses uh, what's called a count min sketch to approximate the frequency of keys in the left hand side collection. I'm going to go into accountman sketch on the next slide, but it is a probabilistic data structure. Um, and it helps us partition this left hand side into two collections where one represents the hot keys and one represents the chill keys, which have a normal distribution. Um, from there, this kind of hot collection, we can assume it's relatively small. You know, it's not going to be every other key, it's a relatively small set. And so it's appropriate to join that using a hash join, um, which is efficient and performant. Um, and meanwhile, you can just do a regular vanilla join on this chill collection. And then to finish, you just return the union of both joins. So um, to go into the Countman sketch a little more, it's a probabilistic data structure that can approximate the frequency of elements in a stream um, it uses several hash functions to operate as basically a sublinear space hash table. Um, the trade-off of saving space compared to a hash table is that it might sometimes overcount due to hash collision. And I'm going to go through an example uh, so we can visualize what that would look like. So here's our count min sketch. Um, in this toy example, we're just using four hash functions um, and we count them eight 
columns. Um, so again, very tiny example. But here we're going to go through a stream of data. So and this data is our integers. So the first element in the stream is the number 7. We're going to feed that as input to each of the four hash functions, modulo 8, right? And this is where it ends up on this matrix, OK? So the next element in the stream is 3. We're going to repeat that operation. And you can see that in three out of the four hash functions, there's no collision. It gets its own column, you know, but in hash three, you do see a collision there. They both end up in the fourth box. So third and final, we get another seven. And here we go. You can see it's going in the same box as the, as the first seven. Um, and yeah, if we look at the seven, the red X's, you can see in three rows, there are two X's, and in a third row, there are three. So this is where the min part of account min sketch comes in, where to get the frequency, we'll just take the minimum of those four values, which is two. Um, so in this example, we get the exact right answer. In practice, it's not exact, but it's pretty good um, for our purposes. So now I'm going to jump into the skewed join algorithm itself. Um, so again, we start with the left and right hand sides. Um, I made the left hand side to have uh, a hot key, which is K1. There are four instances of it on the left hand side. Um, and the first step, as I said, is to do this partition. And to do that, we use this count min sketch as an aggregator on the left hand side key set specifically. And here you can see it, I configured it with a hotkey threshold of four, which is contrived. The, the real default value in Shio is 10,000, um, which is more realistic. <laughs> um, but that aggregator will spit out a set of the hot and the cold keys based on that threshold. So you can see all of the K1s end up in the hot collection. Everything else is in the cold collection. And we haven't done anything with the right hand side yet. So, and then we perform our two joins. One is the hash join on the hotkeys, and one is the normal cogroup based cold join um, on the cold key set. And finally, we take the union and we end up with our full result. Um, so that's skewed join. Um, next, I'm going to go into what we call the sort merge bucket algorithm. Um, it's based on a Spark optimization of the same name. Uh, we, we implemented it uh, for Shio. So SMB, as we call it, is an optimization for data sets that are naturally keyed, write once, and read often. And what do I mean by that? Naturally keyed, for example, if you had a data set that represents event data, a natural key might be user ID. Or for Spotify, song ID, album ID, it, you know. And then by write once, read often, I mean the data set's going to be produced by one pipeline and have many consumers who are going to want to join or group by that natural key, OK? And so this optimization is kind of akin to adding a database index on a particular column to optimize that, um, but for file system-based data sets. So it transfers this shuffle burden from all of the consumers to the right pipeline. Um, so the sort merge write algorithm, I have a diagram here. Um, basically, it works by, at its core, deterministically co-locating keyed data. <laughs> so what's going to happen is you have your um, P collection or S collection of elements, um, and you're going to map over that collection um, and assign what's called a bucket ID to each element. So by bucket ID, um, what we're going to do is apply a hash function, a deterministic hash function, to the natural key of each record. You know, so let's say user ID to continue our example. Um, and you're going to hash, which gives you an integer value. And then the user will specify a number of buckets, which is as a power of two. Um, and we're going to modulo that hash value by the number of buckets. And that will give you your bucket ID assignment. 
Okay, so every element is assigned a bucket between zero and num buckets minus one. And from there, we're going to perform a group by key operation on bucket ID. And within that bucket, in the, within that materialized iterable, we're going to sort every element um, absolutely by its key bytes in lexicographic order. So you're ending up with buckets that are in a deterministic bucket location and absolutely sorted within that bucket. Um, and from there, you're going to apply a write operation on each bucket, maintaining the sorted order. And you can see in the diagram, the bucket file name is going to contain information on that bucket ID and the variable n, which is number of buckets. Um, so that uh, bucketing information is inherently encoded in the data set itself. So in the join operation, um, the downstream read, um, it's the sort merge join API, as you can see. Um, so in this join, you don't have to do any shuffle like you would in a regular co-group based join. This is because the shuffle has already been done, essentially. Um, so on the read side, what happens is you open um, a number of readers between one and number of buckets, and each reader will be assigned one or a range of bucket IDs. And then for each source, it will open that corresponding bucket file. So you can see in the diagram, reader zero opens bucket zero for every source. Okay. And so we know they will contain the exact same key ranges. You know, if user is like an integer, you know, user one will be in the exact same bucket across every source and in the same relative positioning because it's sorted. So in that way, you're just opening these file handles, reading, and as you go, you're just kind of zipping together the results because they are in sorted order. So you're just constructing key groups in memory and outputting them um, as co-group results classes. Um, and then we additionally have an optimization called sort merge transform. This kind of combines the SMB write and read. It's used for enriching one or more SMB sources. Say you have one large SMB source and you want to enrich it with data from another source that's in the same SMB keyed format. Um, it would be computationally wasteful if you wanted to join them and then rewrite in the same bucketing scheme because you'd have to reshuffle, regroup, resort, right? So what we can do since the bucketing information is encoded you know, in the file name and in the elements, we can just open readers as we do in the sort merge join, apply a transform function to each key group, and then you just write it to the uh, output file of the same bucket ID. You know, you're already in the sorted order, you're already in the right bucket, the information is all there. Uh, so that is the sort merge transform. Finally, um, we have hyperlog log. So this is not a join as such, but it is a way to aggregate and reduce large amounts of data. Um, so hyperlog log is another probabilistic data structure. It's used to elevate the number of distinct elements in a large data set. And it's used to solve the count distinct problem. So at Spotify, an example of that problem is how many unique listeners does this album have? Okay, and so if you think if you want to solve this without, if we didn't have hyperlog log, how would we solve it? You'd have to perform a group by key operation on album, materialize every stream data for that album in memory, and put them into a data set like a, a Java set, um, a data structure like a Java set, rather, um, to compute the number of distinct elements. And very quickly, you would run out of memory. Um, you'd have to provision you know, huge machines for that. <laughs> so thankfully, we do have this hyperlog log, which is basically a bit set. It kind of works similar to Countman sketch in that it applies hash functions to the uh, input elements that you feed it. And it approximates distinct size by taking the max number of leading zeros among the binary representation of all of the elements you've inputted to it. Um, and so since it's just a bit set, it's, it's really perfect for distributed applications like MapReduce because it's you can serialize it to bytes, you can read it back from bytes, and you can merge two HLLs into one. 
So it's perfect for something like a reduced operation in which workers will work on like a tiny chunk of work and then those kind of partial outputs will be uh, recursively merged together until you end up with, you know, in this example, one HLL representing every piece of streaming data for an album. Um, so we integrate, so hyperlog log is just the name of the algorithm. There's like a white paper, but the specific implementation that we use is hyperlog log plus from Google's Zeta sketch library, which is open source. Um, sketch here refers to like a summary of a large amount of data and the plus part of the hyperlog log plus means it's more, it has optimizations to make it more accurate for different data shapes. Um, and these integrations are available in the Shio Extra artifact. So that is all we have for today. Um, I included some references uh, to our GitHub site with docs, to code snippets and Shio examples, and we're also on Slack if you want to find us there. All right, thanks for listening. There might be some delay. So uh, if, does anyone have questions? We have one question. As before, please come here to the podium. Hello. Um, so I was curious about uh, some of the details of the large hash join we talked about where you're writing the right-hand data set to disk. Um, so it seemed like you're using GCS primarily as like the sort of the, the data store where uh, each worker um, essentially like, like you have to write the right hand side to, to GCS once and then all the workers read it. Um, so I was wondering if you'd experimented at all with uh, instead of using GCS as an intermediate later, like streaming the, the data set directly to the disks. I don't really know how you do that in Beam, um, but it seems like that might save you some time and it would also perhaps keep you from having to like split your pipeline on the, the GCS right. Um, yeah, so I don't have any, have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I don't know that there's a good way to do it exactly like your suggested uh, solution. What we do do often internally is write these. So the example I gave is using um, an in pipeline Sparky write. And in the case, in many cases internally, we actually write the Sparky in a separate job. So you would do, you would write a single Sparky that contains, for example, a lookup of all track metadata. Sure. and pull that into a bunch of independent pipelines. So the, the write would actually happen elsewhere. I see. Um, and you, you use a different sort of, uh, we use like Luigi internally to check if that's you know, completed and, and pull that into our um, our actual production pipelines. Got it. So it's also kind of in that uh, write once, read many sort of paradigm. Exactly, yeah. OK, cool. Great, thank you. Um, I guess it would be cool, I think, if we had some way to like stream side inputs to disk like that, like the same way you can do it in memory. Um, but yeah, I don't know of any way to do that in Beam at the moment. So. Yeah, we've like we've tried that with SMB actually, like oh, really? add an optimization where we basically like copy a set number of bytes from the like input files to disk to read them. Yeah. Um, I think it works well. It is it is kind of like a trade-off because then you have to like provision bigger disks. But um, right. I think in certain use cases it worked well. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Maybe if you use like file pointers. Well. Yeah. I'm not. I, I'd have to think about the details a little bit more. But uh, seems like maybe a cool, cool area to send us a PR. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's also kind of tricky because like the file systems API, like the Beam file systems API, is what we generally work with. So it's like you can't really take advantage of many like GCS specific features, which is you know good and bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. It would be nice to get better access to the disk. So, okay, thank you. Appreciate the talk. Okay, do we have any additional question? Please. Hello. Um, uh, my question is related to the previous question. Uh, and the question is, um, instead of using GCS, did you try to experiment with uh, um, things like Bigtable where uh, you should get a much better latency? And it's already sort of uh, naturally um, 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 Kind of index, but not index, but uh, accesses by keys and whatnot. Any uh, any thoughts on that? Just curious. yeah. So we we use Bigtable extensively internally, but we um, the latency for lookups is larger than hitting disk once. Basically, is is the short of it. So if your dataset isn't 
super massive, then uh, you can get away with using a Spark. It's a little, it's a little simpler uh, for, for users of the API. They don't have to provision a big table instance and manage it and so on. Okay. Big, big table is also a good, a good choice in many cases. Okay. Do we have any additional questions? So, uh, first of all, thanks again, Kellen and Claire. And uh, I think we're going to take like a five minute break before the next quest, uh, the next session. Uh, so, Annika, can you uh, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, then the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. All right. So, uh, my name is Annika Ivert. I'm a data engineer at Spotify. And I will talk about how to optimize uh, creating rollups using Shiu. So the previous presentation went through a bunch of different join optimizations that are available in Shiu. What I will do here instead is to focus on one specific function called rollup and count, which is optimizing how, the way you can produce rollups in your data set. So I will kind of talk about how this uh, came about. So go back to the use case that we had at Spotify. We had this pipeline where we were processing a lot of data and we were creating rollups, which were quite expensive. These jobs had long run times and we had to kind of rethink how we could make this more efficient. So I will talk about what rollups actually are, why do we need them and why it be can become so expensive if you kind of do the uh, straightforward implementation. And then I will go into detail about the algorithm that we are using to optimize this rollup computation. So, okay, first the use case at Spotify. So um, we were doing this in a team that were computing company key metrics. So for instance, how many subscribers do we have? how many daily or monthly active users do we have? And these metrics were then used, for instance, for quarterly reports, so externally. So for that reason, it was very important that uh, the data was very accurate. But we also used it for internal analysis. So we wrote the data to a BigQuery dataset with a bunch of more dimensions than what we were reporting externally. And uh, if you would do this, I mean, if you do this every day, it's not such a heavy data processing problem. We would just take, okay, all the streams that the users are streaming on that day, kind of aggregate it to user level, then create the metric, and we have one data point for a specific day for all the dimensions. And then we do this the next day. But what makes this extra um, heavy in our use case is that we're also dealing with fraud. So here we are just creating um, each data point in the metric every day. But then if we let some days pass, we have a different history because our fraud teams are every day detecting fraud. And most of this fraud is like detected immediately or within the first or second day of activity. But we have to, we cannot rule out the possibility that the fraud teams are actually catching a user that was active like two years ago. And we want our metrics to be really accurate. So we are, for that reason, kind of reprocessing all of this data every day. Or we actually built a bit smarter um, architecture so we don't reprocess all of the data, uh, we, but we still reprocess a lot of data every day. Um, so let's look a bit about uh, what the data actually looks like. Uh, so on user uh, level, we are aggregating all of the stream data for each user and each cohort. So cohort is just uh, the set of dimensions. Uh, and here we have two users. User one appears twice in this data set because user one streamed both music and podcast. Uh, we can look at the different type of dimensions that we can have here. So the first two dimensions are tied to the user. So the user has a country and the user is either a subscriber or not. And we say that the user can only have one value for the country in a given time period, for instance, day. 
So if the user switches country in the middle of the day, we still say that the country for this user was US because that was the country that the user had at the end of the day. But these other three dimensions on the right hand side, they are tied to streams. So um, a user stream a specific content, music or podcast. And we really want to count the users that listen to music, the, li the users that li listen to podcasts and how much they played. Uh, so if we would create a metric from this data, and this metric would only have a user dimension, like country. We would get a metric with the country US, one user, country Sweden, one user. And if we would want to sum this data set, so how many users do we have in total, then we would get two users. And this is fine. This is correct. Because it will never be the case that the one user in US and the one user in Sweden is the same, because they can only have one country. But if we do the same for content type, then we would have two users that listen to mu music and one user that listen to podcast. And from this metric data set, if we would just simply sum these, we would get three and we would double count user one. And there's really no way of knowing if this user that listen to podcast is the same or not as a user who listened to music. So another example of this, uh, this is actually all of the stream level dimensions that we have in our data set. So we look at platform, uh, OS, whether or not the, the content is curated by Spotify, what the user stream, music or podcast, which app the user stream from, so the main app or there is a Spotify kids app. Um, so if we have this data, this user level data and we create a metric, we could get something like this. We have two rows and one have user count of two and one have user count of one. So um, if you just look at this and you take some seconds to think about this, what are the total number of users that stream during this day? Um, so the answer is that we don't know. It could be two or it could be one. Oh, it could be three because, okay, Let's, let's look at the user uh, level data again. Oh, now we see that user one actually streamed both music and podcast, so there were only two users. But if the user that streamed podcast was another user, like user three, then we would have had three users, and there's no way of knowing. So how can we create a data set where we allow users to sum over any dimensions, the stream level dimensions as well? So one option is to use hyperlog log, which is what Claire talked about in the previous presentation. So uh, you, you, you can also use it, like store it in a data set in BigQuery. And then it is this probabilistic uh, data structure that is summable. So if you remember, it does a hash on the user and counts the number of leading zeros and keeps track of the max. Um, and this is kind of representing the set of users. So if we actually had the set of users, we could just union them and count distinct and we would get an exact result, but that's like we can't store 200 million users as a set in BigQuery um, for each row. <laughs> so if we instead use a hyperlog log, uh, we take up very little space and we can still do the summation, but the drawback is that we only get an approximate distinct count. And the other way to solve this, because um, if you remember, we are reporting these metrics externally, and we can't really say that, oh, this is just an approximate daily active user counts. We have uh, 200 million uh, plus minus 200,000 users. The investors would be quite um, perplexed, I think. Um, so what you can do instead to have an exact um, solution is to create rollups, which is basically that we are pre-calculating all of these sums that we cannot do otherwise. Uh, but the drawback here is that it would be computationally extensive. So okay, I'll talk a bit about what rollups actually are. Um, so rollups are pre-aggregations over, in our case, the stream dimensions. So we cannot sum them. 
So what we do instead is that we pre-calculate the sums and put them in the data set for all of the combinations. So the data set grows quite a lot. Uh, so in this case, we are null is representing all. So if you want to get the sum for users um, that stream mobile iOS um, false main, you look at this row where content type is null because then it's summed over content type. So if you would want to get the total count per platform, you do something like this query. Um, so you set all of the other stream level dimensions to null and you sum. And why is this so computationally heavy? Like the, the, the basic pipeline that you would write if you would just implement this, it's quite simple. You're just reading the data, you're grouping by user ID, and then you're creating this huge panel because um, each of the users, like user two, is active on mobile OS music, but it should be counted in all of these um, two to the power of three, because we have three dimensions, eight um, rows. So we need to create all of these eight rows. Um, and for user two, user one, we create 12 rows. So it's a bit less the multiplier per row because it's active on um, two cores and some of them are the same, so we can sum. But it's still, we're creating a lot of extra rows. And we're doing this before we're actually uh, summing to get the, the metric, so before the aggregation. And that, that means that we need to shuffle all of these extra rows, which is not good. And if we look at some numbers, uh, this is what happens. So this is two jobs. Um, one job had 1 billion rows as input, and the other one, 37 billion. And after this fan out step, in one case, we got 20 billion, and in one case, um, or 1 trillion. And the multiplier is uh, 22 and 31. And like the exact multiplier is a bit dependent on how how these users are active, if they're active on only one chord or multiple chords. Uh, and we had five stream level dimensions in this case, so the maximum is 32. And what you can see then is then when we actually aggregate and create the metrics, the data set naturally shrinks a lot. So it's like 3% of the original input and like 0.1% of the data we had after fan out. Um, so is there a way that we can optimize this? So what we can do is to make some observations of our data. Why are we creating rollups? We are creating rollups because we don't want to double count users. But if we look at these two users, we know that user two, it will never be double counted. It's just active on one single cohort. Uh, user one will be double counted because it's actually two, two cohorts, um, but not in every sum, only if we sum over content type. So we can safely sum over, for instance, get all the users to listen to music on uh, iOS, and it will be correct. So what you can do here is kind of say, OK, can we invert the problem somehow? Uh, can we? Instead, double count things and in the end, correct it somehow. Because correcting a faulty metric is much cheaper than counting the users in all of the combinations. And it will always be the case. Because when we're counting users in all combinations, we're doing this fan out, we are doing multiplying everything by a number that is two to the power of or something like that. But if we're correcting the faulty metric, we're only creating a row when we actually need to, when we're actually double counting this user. So the actual um, new implementation of the pipeline would look something like this. So we are reading the data, and then there's two branches. So on the left-hand side, we are doing what I call here the naive sum. So we're just we don't care about rollups at first. We just create the metric. Um, and then we kind of just append the 
the rollups to the metric. And when we have the metric, we lost all user level information. So we are double counting things. We reduce the data a lot. This was like 3% of the original input, but the results incorrect because we have all of these trees where we're double counting user one. But what you can do then is what you see on the left hand side, which is called the correction. We go through the users and we see that user one is actually going to be double counted on these four cohorts. So we create the metric, um, the correction metric, and we want to subtract minus one on these four rows. And then we can simply combine this and we get uh, you know, the correct data with rollups. And if we look at some results, uh, this is what we see. We had one of these pipelines were quite expensive. It cost like $800 per day. But after this optimization, it went down to $50. $50. We shuffled 140 terabytes. Uh, after optimization, it was 7.5. And we also gained a lot of runtime. And we had six jobs doing this. So the total gainings went from 1,000 to uh, something like $75. Um, and then this is kind of a generic use case. Uh, you have a data set where you want to create rollups. So we also put this in Geo. And it looks something like this if you want to use it. Um, it's called Rollup and Count, and it's part of the Geo Extra package. What you need to provide is the rollup function. So it's here called grouping sets. So how, how do you want to? Uh, extend your data. We are doing all the combinations. We have the five dimensions, and we are basically doing like null, 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 do, 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 all of the 32 combinations. But you might also imagine that, okay, there is a limitation here. Uh, in this data set, you can't query all the users that listen to um, podcast and music, for instance, or on iOS and Android, then you would have to create this um, kind of uh, music and podcast row independently and create the sum. So you could do that. You, you can decide how you want to uh, fan out your data. Um, and here, so the input um, is a couple of four things. First, the thing that you want to count distinct on, which is in our case, user ID. Then there are, um, so you can have other dimensions, like these user level dimensions, like country, that you're not doing roll up on. So this is the second thing in the tuple. Then we have our stream level dimensions. And finally, you can have other measures, like we're also summing the milliseconds played for each of these users. And this is not a distinct count. This is just something that we want to sum normally. Um, so this you also provide here. OK, so that was it. Do you have any questions? So do we have any questions? OK. It seems we don't have any additional questions. So just to confirm, OK. So thanks again, Annika, for the session. Thank you.